Right, let's press on. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12690 in the name of Angela Constance on improving the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 12 minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I want to welcome members of the Gypsy Traveller community who have joined us today in the public gallery. I understand you have travelled from Aberdeenshire, North and South Lanarkshire, East Ayrshire, and from my own constituency in West Lothian, as well as from the Cairntow site uh, here in Edinburgh. And I want to start, as I did in a recent debate brought forward by Mary Fee, MSP, by saying to every member of the Gypsy Traveller community who are with us today, but also every member of the Gypsy Traveller community, the length and breadth of Scotland, that this is your parliament, and like all citizens of Scotland, you deserve the very best of representation from your elected politicians. And over the years, we know that parliament has had three inquiries and has returned time and time again to the issues of inequality and racism and the consequences of such to the Gypsy Traveller community. More recently, the Equality and Human Rights Committee also focused on gypsy travellers to mark Human Rights Day in December of last year. And more recently as well, Mary Fee led an excellent members debate uh, only a few weeks ago. And some of the gypsy travellers who are here today have been directly involved in these meetings and in these inquiries. And I want to thank you for your input over many years and for not allowing us to forget about the inequalities you face and the human rights that you are unable as yet to enjoy. And I think it's fair to say that there has been plenty of talk and insufficient action. We have indeed made some progress, it's fair to record that, but progress has been patchy, progress has been inconsistent, and to be frank, it's quite simply not been good enough, and this is what has to change. And as we mark the centenary of Votes for Women, I am reminded of the motto of the suffrage movement, which fits well with our aims to improve the lives of gypsy travellers. This has to be about deeds, not words. And today, President Officer, I want to put on record the Scottish Government's clear and unwavering commitment to improving the lives of gypsy travellers. But first, I want to set the context for this. As members will recall, the Independent Race Equality Advisor, Callie Annie Lyle, who published her report in December 2017, reported that on every indicator of what is required to live a happy, productive and fulfilled life, gypsy travellers are worse off than any other community in Scotland. And when we published the Race Equality Action Plan the same month, I acknowledged that we needed to do much more to develop what I called a radical new approach which will bring about change on a much shorter time scale. And this is the context for the creation of the new ministerial working group which I chair and which brings together ministers with responsibility for housing, education, employment and health. And the job of the ministerial working group is to develop and drive forward that radical new approach across government and to bring about real change at a much faster pace. Our approach is firmly rooted in human rights and we will take full account of the recommendations of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which challenges state partners to, I quote, to ensure a systematic and coherent approach in addressing the challenges that members of these communities continue to face. The Ministerial Working Group has met twice this year. The first meeting focused on accommodation, where we looked at a range of issues, including site provision and site standards. And since then, we've published a review of site standards ahead of the minimum standards coming into effect uh, this month. And we've also been working on a set of proposals to ensure that the planning system uh, better meets the needs uh, of the community. And the second meeting of the Ministerial Working Group looked at education. We heard directly from David Donaldson, a young gypsy traveller who is the driving force behind the new Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly. And he gave us a, a very powerful insight into the experiences of young gypsy travellers within our schools and within our education system. And we will have two further meetings this year when we will focus on employment and when we will focus on health. 
And early next year, we will share a draft set of actions which we will discuss with the community and those who work with them. And by this time next year, we will publish a concrete set of actions to be delivered in the current parliamentary term. And, presiding officer, and I can say this to Chamber today, it will not just be warm words, it will not be more of the same, because clearly that has not worked. And can I put it simply that the status quo is not an option. So we must be bold and we must be innovative and we must be radical if we are to make real, tangible improvements which have a positive impact on our gypsy travellers. Presiding officer, Callie Annie Lyle's report made it absolutely clear that delivering genuine improvements in the life chances of Scotland's gypsy travellers over a relatively short period of time will be dependent on the community being involved as full partners in planning and delivery. And I couldn't agree more. And so in the Race Equality Action Plan, we said we would establish a mechanism to ensure continued engagement with members uh, of the gypsy traveller community. And over the past few months, uh, working with the community and with trusted partners in both the public sector and the third sector, we have identified uh, a very strong desire from women who want to become more active in their personal lives, as well as being more engaged with civic matters at a local and national level. And so I am delighted to announce that we will invest £100,000 in a new Gypsy Traveller Women's Voices project, which will engage with women to build their confidence, to build their capacity and encourage participation in daily and public life in Scotland, focusing on issues that matter most to them. The Gypsy Traveller Women's Voices project will be run by MECOP alongside their existing uh, Gypsy Traveller Support Project, which we have funded for a, a number of years. And it will offer a range of learning, development and support opportunities uh, to collaboratively empower women uh, in this most marginalised of communities. And I'm really looking forward uh, to working closely with these remarkable women uh, to improve the lived experiences and life chances of themselves uh, and their families over the months and years ahead. The Gypsy Traveller Women's Voices Project will complement the new Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly, which we recently welcomed to this parliament. Over the next two years, we will continue to provide direct financial and practical support uh, to the Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly to help strengthen their active participation in decisions that affect their lives. And this will include a, a programme of training and mentoring which will be tailored to the needs of individual members and the group as a whole. So I hope that our support for these two new pieces of work demonstrates that we are serious in our endeavours to work with the community to develop actions which meet their needs and their aspirations and which are delivered in a way that is appropriate eh, and culturally sensitive. Presiding officer, I believe that this is an ideal time to be having this important debate for three reasons. Firstly, the new cross-party working group on Gypsy Travellers eh, will have its first meeting tomorrow. Uh, and I want to thank Mary Fee for establishing the group and thank the team at MECOP for its role as Secretariat. And I will follow the progress of the group with great interest uh, and I look forward, if I can be so bold, uh, to an invitation to contribute to the group. Uh, and I also, in all seriousness, uh, welcome the additional... Certainly. This may be the invitation, Ms Fee. It is the invitation, Presiding <laughs> Officer. Can I just... Um, confirm in, in front of the chamber that the cabinet secretary is more than welcome to attend each and every one of the cross-party groups <laughs> meetings of gypsy travellers well done miss v cabinet Thank secretary v. she is very kind um, in all seriousness presiding officer i also want to welcome the additional scrutiny as well as support which i hope the cross-party uh, working group will bring uh, to the work of the ministerial working group the second reason that this debate is timely is that COSLA's Community Wellbeing Board has recently approved a paper supporting the work of the Ministerial Group. And having discussed this issue with both Councillor Whitam, who is convener of the Community Wellbeing Board, who is joining us today also in the public gallery, and having also discussed this with Councillor Everson, the COSLA president, I am confident that we have their full support. And last but not least, I'm delighted that we're having this debate today because June is Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month, which we are marking for the first time in Scotland this year. And the Scottish Government is proud 
to be supporting two days of events in Edinburgh next week, which will uh, showcase and celebrate Gypsy Roma traveller history and culture and stimulate discussion with a variety of audiences, including school children uh, and uh, leaders of public bodies. And I hope that this will also play a part in challenging stereotypes and reducing discrimination. Poseidon officer, before I finish, I want to draw attention to the intolerable levels of prejudice and hostility which our gypsy traveller communities experience on a daily basis. Such is the fear of a verbal or a physical attack that many choose to hide their identity at school or at work. In fact, I've been really struck by hearing from young people who describe the difficult decision of whether to come out as a gypsy traveller or to hide their identity instead in order to stay safe and in order to feel safe. Now, these hostile attitudes and behaviours have absolutely no place in modern and inclusive Scotland. And we no longer tolerate any other forms of racist abuse. And we must all challenge discrimination towards gypsy travellers whenever we encounter it, whether it's here in this parliament, in our constituencies, or as we go about our daily lives. And I want to close by reinforcing two key points that I've touched upon already. Firstly, my absolute commitment and that of the Scottish Government to do much, much more to address the poor outcomes and the discrimination which this community continues to experience and to do so quickly because it is long overdue. And secondly, I want to seek explicitly the active support of this Parliament as a whole and every individual member elected to it. And I sincerely hope that we can work together across the political, geographical and organisational boundaries to improve the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers community and to put an end to what the Equality and Human Rights Commission rightly describes as the last bastion of respectable racism. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, can I gently say to the, to the public gallery that I understand why you wish to applaud, but it's not permitted in the Scottish Parliament. I say that rebuke very gently, I hope. I call on Annie Wells to speak to and move Amendment 12690.1. Ms Wells, eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Only last month did I speak in Mary Fee's debate on gypsy travellers and how insightful it was to hear from the speakers their thoughts on what needs to be done to improve the lives of the people in this community. I was greatly encouraged by the cross-party support we saw in the last debate, and I am pleased to see that this issue is finally getting the attention it deserves. As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I have been made well aware of the issues that surround the gypsy traveller community, whether this is in housing, education, employment or health. The Scottish Parliament has a long history with this topic, and in 2001, the then, Equalities and Oppor the then Equal Opportunities Committee carried out an inquiry into gypsy travellers and public sector policies. In 2012 and 2013, two reports were published, on which, as a committee, we undertook an evidence session last June. In assessing the progress that has been made since, we heard from members of the gypsy traveller community, and to quote David Donaldson, since the Scottish Parliament's inception, very little has changed. In fact, the situation has remained completely stagnant. In all fairness, when speaking in last month's debate, the Cabinet Secretary was very honest about the lack of progress, stating, until this point, it had been patchy and inconsistent. And I recognise the work that's being done through the work of the new ministerial group and the establishment of the Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly, which I sincerely hope provide the step change needed. I recognise that the group is working with the community, and I hope that in doing so, a balance is reached between bridging the gaps with public, services, public service provision and maintaining the traditional way of life. As alluded to in my amendment, I absolutely support those moves, but believe that it is vital in going forward that measurable indicators are provided in order to review the progress being made. Central to this lack of progress, I believe, is a lingering sense that it's OK to be discriminatory towards gypsy travellers. Whereas public attitudes in Scotland to diversity and ethnic minorities have improved greatly in the last 20 years. The worrying exception to this trend seems to be the gypsy traveller community. Yes. Ruth McGuire. 
I thank Annie Wells for taking an intervention. I wonder, while she's making that point, if she can confirm if her colleague, Douglas Ross, has um, received any disciplinary action against him or undertaken any diversity training for his, frankly, shameful comments last year. Annie Wells. I thank Ruth McGuire. Um, I don't set the disciplinary arrangements on the party, but I do know that um, the member had made an apology. I'm speaking here on behalf of me in this, in this parliament, and I just want to make sure that we do create the cross-party consensus that we have done so far in the previous debates yeah. that we've had within this parliament. Yeah. And the government will have my full support and the Scottish Conservatives' full support yeah. in that. The most recent social Scottish Social Attitude Survey showed that 31% of people in Scotland would be unhappy if a relative married someone from the Gypsy Traveller community and 34% of people thought a Gypsy Traveller would be unsuitable to be a primary school teacher. And we've seen these attitudes simmer into popular culture. In 2012, we saw how Channel 4's Big Fat Gypsy Wedding series came under fire after it was blamed for an increase in bullying and negative stereotyping of the Gypsy Traveller communities. We should shine a light on this community, not for entertainment, but to celebrate the rich culture contribution gypsy travellers have made to the Scottish society since as far back as the 12th century. And as Mary Fee greatly emphasised in the members' debate, the gypsy traveller community is extremely diverse and vibrant, characterised by a strong sense of cultural identity. Ob often absent from history or misrepresented, it is a culture with a rich variety of languages and strong oral tradition with stories passed down from generation to generation. Some groups are highly mobile, moving on when work opportunities have been exhausted, and others live permanently in one area, sometimes traditional brick and mortar home, traveling only a few weeks or months of the year. When I was reading through old committee reports, it was the written evidence of, the gyp of gypsy traveler, N Nadia Foy, that made me truly understand the importance of identity and tradition to this community. She said, for us, traveling is not just physically moving, it's a state of mind. We often say it's in our blood. And this is why I too welcome the first ever Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month in Scotland, taking place this month, and I look forward to hearing more about it. And when it comes to alienation from public services, the impact of mar marginalization is clear and obvious boundaries remain. Something that is magnified by culture of self-reliance and the likelihood that some families will have no permanent address. Accessing service provision can therefore be difficult. With health, many gypsy travellers often face difficulties trying to visit a GP, and evidence from the 2012 committee highlighted that some gypsy travellers will travel as far as 300 miles to see a dentist or doctor they trust and know will see them. The impact of this is clear. Many gypsy travellers experience inexcusable health inequalities and lower life expectancies. The age profile of gypsy travellers is much younger as compared to the population as a whole, with only 28% of the population aged 45 and over, as compared with 44% of the population as a whole. In 2012, a number of suggestions were put forward regarding outreach initiatives and health visits to sites, where patients could be put in direct contact with health professionals. And I'd be extremely grateful to the Cabinet Secretary to hear more on that and what work is being done now. And when it comes to education, we know that there can be difficulties in accessing education services when travelling. And in addressing this, we can see what work can be done to expand initial efforts to provide flexible alternatives to school-based learning. I also look forward to hearing from the Cabinet Secretary on the bridging programmes which will assist younger members of the community transition into mainstream education. As shown during the committee evidence sessions, Bullying and discrimination also remain huge barriers to learning within schools. Many gypsy traveller children continue to be singled out with many hiding their ethnicity to get through school. Again, I look forward to hearing more about what will be done to assist schools in being better prepared to respond to gypsy traveller needs and counter discrimination. When it comes to housing, minimum standards for council assigned sites are not being met with many built in undesirable and unsafe locations, often on unpopular brownfield sites. Many sites often experience issues with dampness, mould and access to water. I'm therefore pleased that the Scottish Government has been proactive in addressing this by working together with local authorities and COSLA. And I look forward to seeing how partnership working will bring about innovative practice in this area. 
And to finish today, I would like to again reiterate my support for the Scottish Government's motion. It is welcome that the lives of Gypsy Traveller community are being discussed more prominently across this chamber, as it, only it is only by highlighting their issues that we will begin to progress their lives among our communities in a fairer way. The working group is also a step in the right direction, and I would urge the Scottish Government to continue to be open and transparent about the work the group is doing, not only for benefit of the members in this chamber, but more importantly, the Gypsy Traveller community. Sadly, we still see the Gypsy Traveller community stereotyped in many walks of life, but by working together, we can preserve the traditions of a traditional community in the modern world. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Ms Wells. And I call on Monica Lennon to speak to move amendment 12690.3. Seven minutes, please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for bringing forward this important debate appro appropriately timed during Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month and following on from Mary Fee's recent members' debate. I would like to commend Mary Fee uh, on her passionate campaigning to improve the lives of Gypsy Traveller community, uh, which is not just one singular community, but comprised of diverse groups, each with its own unique culture and history. Before I had ever met Mary, I was aware of her uh, work in the field of equalities and for being a champion for seldom heard, heard voices. So I'm really proud to be sitting on the bench next to Mary uh, today. Um, I would like to thank, um, we're well not just here to thank each other as politicians, but I would like to thank the many organisations, including the Equality and Human Rights Commission and MECOP Care Centre, for their contributions, as well as campaigning organisations, including the Gypsy Council, the Scottish Gypsy Traveller Association, the Scottish Gypsy and Traveller Law Coalition, and the Young Gypsy Traveller Assembly. And like the Cabinet Secretary, I also would like to welcome the Gypsy Traveller members who are here in the Parliament today, who are heard watching the debate, wherever they may be. And it's great news that the Cabinet Secretary, I think, has cleared her diary to be available <laughs> for uh, future meetings of uh, the, the cross-party group on Gypsy Travellers. Gloria Buckley, MBE, a traveller herself and a tireless campaigner for the Gypsy Traveller community, said, we are one community, the travellers and our settled neighbours. We've all got something in common. We want our children to be healthy and educated. As many of us in the chamber begin to organise events in support of the great get together in memory of the late MP Joe Cox, this sentiment that there is more that unites us and divides us is very much on our minds. The huge importance of family to the Gypsy Traveller community is a value that many people in Scotland share. We want our loved ones to be looked after in illness and old age. We want our children to be healthy, safe and educated. It is a sad fact that the settled community can take this much more for granted than our Gypsy Traveller neighbours. The life expectancy of a man from the Gypsy Traveller community is on average 10 years less than the national average. Gypsy Traveller children are more likely than the general population to have no educational qualification. Heartbreakingly, gypsy and travelling mothers are 20 times more likely than the rest of the population to have experienced the death of a child. So I do agree with the Cabinet Secretary, we do indeed need a radical and new approach. This hardship happens against a backdrop of prejudice and discrimination, which is so prevalent it has been called the last acceptable form of racism. In the most recent social attitude survey, over a third of Scots said that they would be unhappy about a close relative marrying a gypsy traveller. It is perhaps little wonder, therefore, that up to 15,000 people do not disclose their gypsy traveller identity. The most recent census found that there are over 4,000 gypsy travellers in Scotland, but the actual amount is estimated to be between 15 and 20,000. Tensions between the settled community and the gypsy traveller community can often arise when gypsy travellers set up in unauthorised settlements. But with insufficient and inadequate sites, the gypsy traveller community are left with no real options. In my local area of South Lanarkshire, there are two authorised gypsy traveller sites, um, council sites, but there is a lack of adequate sites um, across the patch in other neighbouring authorities and indeed across Scotland. 
So the ongoing work by COSLA and the collaborative approach between the government and COSLA to improve site provision is very welcome. Because even when there is provision, it isn't always up to an acceptable standard. In fact, it rarely is. So it's good we have the commitment from COSLA, but as COSLA have said in, the, in their briefing to, to MSPs, it will take significant levels of investment to bring sites up to standard, and I hope the commitment to make that happen is there. The Equality and Human Rights Committee heard one gypsy traveller describe the squalid conditions of some sites. This individual gave an example where an authorised site was, in his words, overflowing with rats. When he went to the warden seeking help, concerned for the safety of his young family, the warden told him to get a cat. The same person described the transformative difference just one person can make. He then spoke about a new warden who cared, who got things done, who spoke to officials and made things better for the gypsy travellers at that site. Whilst there is a lot of frustration about the lack of progress, it is important to recognise the important contributions of those local authority employees who act as friends and champions for the gypsy traveller community. Individuals can make a difference. But we shouldn't afford, or we can't afford to make this a postcode lottery for gypsy travellers where they have better experiences in some local authorities than in others. So action by the Scottish Government and the Parliament is crucial. For example, the recent legislation to improve site standards is welcome. And I did speak in, in Mary Fee's members debate about my previous experience representing people from the gypsy traveller community in my former work as a town planner. So I'm, I'm grateful that the cabinet secretary has made a commitment to improve the, the planning system. I know that myself and, and Mary Fee and others will be looking at amendments, uh, but again, hopefully we can do this in a collaborative fashion. Presiding officer, legislation is important, but piecemeal change is not enough. There have been multiple inquiries in the last 17 years, but there has been little progress. A national strategy on gypsy travellers was recommended by the Equal Opportunities Committee back in 2013, but this did not <coughs> materialise. I am glad that the Scottish Government has now acted on the Independent Race Equality Advisors call for leadership on this issue, and the Ministerial Working Group on Gypsy Travellers has been set up. Because simply, the, the government and the parliament work, must work together on this issue. Mary Fee's cross-party group is a positive development, and uh, I'm pretty confident it won't just be a talking shop, because we, we've had enough of that. The voices are certainly there. Um, I would like to commend the Gypsy Traveller community on their work, and they should feel immense, proud for the way, immense pride for the way they have organised and campaigned for their communities. Uh, presiding officer, um, with compassion and commitment across Scotland, I do believe that real change is possible. I am uh, proud to move the amendment in my name and I'm pleased to give the Scottish Government's motion our full support and the other amendments that we vote on tonight at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. And can I remind members to use full names? I, I, I know it's a friendly debate, but full names, please. So far, anyway, I hope it remains friendly. Uh, can I call on John Finney now to speak to move Amendment 12690.2? Mr Finney, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. And uh, here we are again, once again, talking about gypsy travellers. Now, I don't want to tell you for one second that I don't enjoy the subject, but I do worry about aspects of it, and uh, hopefully that weariness won't... Uh, surface too much in this and it's a weariness built of frustration because I think the cabinet secretary said plenty talk insufficient action so I want to be talking about some actions that we can do and I think it is important that this is uh, Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month and Gypsy Traveller mov movement is root and branch part of Scotland it's root and branch part of these islands and it's root and branch part of Europe and and I have to say uh, on my wall I have many mementos I certainly will Minister um, President officer, I, I agree completely and utterly with Mr Finney and I think um, that some of us don't pay due attention to the influence of some gypsy travellers from Scotland, uh, not only uh, within uh, these islands or within Europe, but internationally. Bob Dylan was influenced by an Aberdeen gypsy traveller, Jeannie Robertson. Not many folk know that. Why is that the case? We would know it if Jeannie Robertson was from some other group. 
Mr Finney. Thanks. In indeed, we, do, uh, we would, and I thank the Minister for highlighting that. Now, in the very limited time I have, I was going to mention Seamus McPhee, who is uh, uh, an active member of the Gypsy Traveller community, and one of his postcards is on my wall. It commemorates the contribution, service and sacrifice of the Gypsy Traveller community during the First World War, and it's called Cannon Fodder. Now, so there's a, a wide contribution there, and the storytelling tradition is very important too. The motion talks about no place for racism in a modern and inclusive Scotland, and some people may, over the weekend, have seen shocking footage from the Ukraine of a Nazi group actually adopting the same name as a, a Nazi group that persecuted Jews in Ukraine during the Second World War, um, attacking a, a, a Roma camp. So we, at our peril, are complacent about, about these things, certainly with the spread of social media, the situation in Hungary, the uh, famous photograph of the Paris suburbs with the daubed uh, sign on the end of the, the building that was to be demolished where the Roma were. And of course, this has been alluded to uh, the conduct of the Murray MP. Um, I wish the ministerial working group very well, um, and there have been plenty of talks. Um, and uh, as regards the amendment I have, which I would like to read out, and that is um, to insert at the end of the motion and recognises the need for such support, and there is undoubtedly support from the Gypsy Traveller community uh, from the Scottish Government, to be underpinned by measures that enable the Gypsy Traveller's traditional way of life, including the mapping of stopping off places, and save in exceptional circumstances these be made available. Now again, in the, the fairly recent debate we had, I, I, I talked about this, but I have to say the language is still flawed in a lot of what we talk about. The government document, the causal document, if we're talking about housing, we're perpetuating the idea that bricks and mortar are the issue. We should be talking about accommodation, and that accommodation may be, may be, a traditional stopping off place because for long and many of these um, reports have alluded to this people have been told your health problems will be sorted if you did one thing if you got in a house well that's deeply offensive we're really going to throw our weight behind the traditional way of life i think we, we want to, to to get that uh, correct um, and accommodation i would suggest may be something now there is review there's been a review and there has been progress and i know and indeed i'm shortly going to be visiting the site at newton moore where i know there's been significant progress uh, done and that is is welcomed the language again regarding stopping off places i've used the traditional stopping off places i had a look through some of the documents uh, and here's some of them negotiated stopping model informal stopping places short-term halting sites stopover site we're talking about accommodation we're talking about reinforcing the commitment we have to supporting a way of life, and that is about the provision of accommodation sites. So I think we do need to change the mindset. I think this is the potential to be a very positive contribution to that, this debate. Um, I formally move the amendment in my name, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. And I call on Alec Cole Hamilton, and then we on to the open debate. Four minutes speeches in the open debate. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking the Government for securing today's time and for the Cabinet Secretary's language in uh, what was a very consensual opening remark. Um, I think we actually share a very strong sense of common purpose in this regard, and I thank her for it. also want to put on my record my thanks to my friend and colleague, Mary Fee. Uh, I will be a proud member of the CPG alongside her, but she has educated me and schooled me in uh, things things I did not know about tr gypsy traveller history and rights and the lack and the deprivation of those. So I thank her for those. But most importantly, I want to thank our uh, friends and our colleagues from the gypsy traveller community who are here in the gallery this afternoon. You are very much part of the fabric of our country and we're very proud to know you. We're very proud to have you here. Deputy Presiding Officer, when we think about the term racism, we often think about, I suppose, the uh, anti-EU migrant attacks in the immediate aftermath of Brexit, which were fueled by the irresponsible rhetoric of papers like the Daily Mail. We think about the hostile environment policies, which uh, led to the Windrush scandal. Um, it's, it comes down to that feel, feeling of othering, that fear of the incomer, fear of change. In truth, as a, a reference, we are all products of a tapestry, a rich tapestry of immigration and movement and uh, uh, people moving around these islands. And it is very much in, uh, subject to our national identity. I like, uh, we often like to think that we're not like that here in Scotland. But as Davy Donaldson said in a very compelling testimony to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee that racism against the gypsy traveller community is the last form of acceptable racism in Scotland. And the irony is gypsy and travellers, gypsies and travellers are not incomers. They have a rich cultural identity which spans a millennium in this country. Seamus McPhee, 
who uh, John Finney referenced earlier, has written a, an excellent history of the gypsy traveller relationship with Scotland, which goes back to the 11th century when the, the, they settled in Scotland and referred to initially as tinklers and then uh, sometimes mistaken for Spaniards and Egyptians, but were treated with reverence where to the point in 1506, a letter of safe passage was written for the, uh, the, king, the Earl of the Egyptians as he was known for safe passage through Denmark. That was changed quite dramatically in 1541 when we saw the first anti-gypsy laws passed in this country, when it was suddenly legal to drown or strangle a gypsy. Now, I, we talk a lot about hostile environment policies, but that takes the biscuit. And whilst we're not quite as severe as that now, there are still throwbacks to that time and that prejudice which permeates our culture. And David Donaldson, again, gave a really harrowing example of a time when he had sat on a youth forum in Aberdeen, which was uh, an interface with the local authority around planning. And the officials and the elected members didn't know that he was a traveler. Uh, and he asked about uh, rights for travelers and the needs uh, for sites around Aberdeen and was told by a very senior member of that council, son, nobody cares about the effing tinks. That is the level of racism that still is at large in our society today. And that comes from a political imbalance. It's, it's, it's absolutely true that the, by the very nomadic nature of uh, travelers who still shift, that they are disenfranchised. They're unlikely to register to vote. So politicians are unlikely to try to appeal to them and more likely try to appease the constituents who are concerned about where they are uh, moving to. So, and we've seen an answer to this failed. Ex well, some experiments like the, the social experiments like the Bobbin Mill, where the, the community there is a fantastic dynamic community, but lived in the worst housing conditions imaginable, where people had to defrost pipes uh, in the winter time. The health inequalities we've heard a lot about, as to have we about education, access to education, the fact that people uh, are still being left behind and we're not addressing this very particular needs. We've heard the statistics about the social prejudices. It is a protected characteristic. We don't often treat it as, a, as such, so I'm happy to support the government's motion and all the amendments today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Open debate, a call Gail Ross. Uh, type four minutes for every day, call Gail Ross. We'll follow by Alexandra Stewart. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. It is appropriate that we've set aside time today for this debate in Gypsy Roma Tra Traveller History Month and to ask what we can do to improve outcomes for the Gypsy Traveller community. Our last census tells us that around 4,200 people in Scotland identify themselves in this group, although people in organisations working with the community believe that figure to be closer to 20,000. Gypsy travellers in Scotland are a diverse group with a long and distinct history, dating to at least as early as the 12th century, with written records in the community surviving from 1492. But despite this long history, Gypsy travellers in Scotland have only been legally recognised as a distinct ethnic group since September 2008. And being appropriately recognised and respected as a distinct ethnic group affords members of the community further protection under the Equalities Act 2010, which specifically prohibits discrimination on the basis of protected characteristics, including ethnic origin. We had a session at the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in December, and the evidence that we heard from the Gypsy Traveller community was harrowing and saddening. The discrimination that this marginalised community has to face on a daily basis is a violation of their human rights, and we must make sure that it's stamped out. As we heard, the Scottish Government has set up a ministerial working group it's now met twice and will report its findings early next year. And this report will set out the group's achievements and progress and implement in the priorities it identifies. The group will work to address inequalities in housing, education, health, social services, employment and community cohesion. One of the actions that interested me was the potential work with young people in this, the year of young people, to tackle discriminatory portrayals of the community in the media. The group will also consider how to improve engagement with the Gypsy Traveller community, essential if we are to even think about tackling all the other issues. We often speak about lived experience, consultation and engagement, and it is vital with this community. And there's an example of this when Seamus McPhee, who has already been referenced, told the com our committee about local authority sites. Gypsy travellers living on sites owned by councils must be provided with secure tenancy agreements, but Seamus raised this point. Gypsy travellers who live on local authority sites in Scotland tend to be bound by a Scottish secure tenancy agreement, 
which limits them to 12 weeks a year in which they can travel off-site. That's a violation of their right to freedom of movement if they can only go off the site for 12 weeks of the year before forfeiting their tenancy on a local authority site. That's an impediment to their ability to lead their cultural lifestyle. So communication is essential. Presiding officer, there is work to be done, this we know, and it would be a disservice to gypsy travellers all over Scotland if we were to pretend that everything's fine. And it was really good to hear the Cabinet Secretary speak about the progress that she wants to see, and we all share that vision. It's also good to see some local authorities with gypsy traveller strategies, working with young people, liaison officers, interagency groups, and site improvement plans. But we need a firm commitment from all local authorities not to wait to do as they're told by the Scottish Government, but to take immediate action to support an isolated community that has the worst health outcomes, the most horrific living conditions, dis disproportionate rates of depression and mental illness, and the poorest educational outcomes in our society. In conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome the commitments by the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government. I think that the amendments from John Finney, Annie Wells, and Monica Lennon are entirely sensible. We do need to monitor progress. There should be a mapping of traditional sites. And I want to wish Mary Fee good luck on her cross-party group. And I will be there tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart, followed by Fulk McGregor. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be able to take part in today's debate. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the work for Mary Fee. I wasn't able to participate uh, in her members' debate, but I was very happy to sit and listen. Uh, and I congratulate Mary Fee on her very passionate and a very positive campaign that she has put forward. Of course, everyone is committed to ensuring equality of opportunity for all in Scotland's gypsy travellers who see themselves as particularly a marginalised group. And we've heard that already this afternoon. Indeed, many of them see their communities uh, and see themselves as coming from the indigenous Highland travellers, the showmen or the funfair travellers that, that we see and have uh, become used to. But their history, their culture, their identity needs to be protected and respected. And I concur with my colleagues who have already said today that they suffer in, 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 in health uh, and their families uh, and education and, and all of those areas where they, where they are not given the opportunities. Uh, and for children who are accessing and obtaining education and employment, it, these are enormous barriers. Therefore, it is essential that we address the work together and we try to support to ensure that gypsy children feel confident and they do not suffer any further under these. I am very encouraged that the Scottish Government has established the Ministerial Working Group on Gypsy Travellers. The group's aim is to ensure that work to uh, get rid of some of these inequalities in housing, in education, in health and in employment. And working together, we can do so much to achieve and results can come forward from that Ministerial Group. And Deputy Presiding Officer, I look forward to seeing what will happen uh, in the not too distant future. A good number of the, the travellers themselves are, are actively involved in business, many of them being successful business individuals with a flourish in entrepreneurial and ownerships of organisations the length and breadth of the country. Indeed, another section of that community becomes successful in the acting and the musician world, uh, where their families have rooted uh, their, their ethnic and their taught and their, their childhood and all of that culture round about them and, and the entertainment industry has done very well by having many of them participate. And individuals like uh, the, the quite famous Billy Welsh from Darlington, who has talked about the Appleby Horse Fair, where we've seen where tens of thousands of individuals go uh, and tourists come and support that uh, environment. Uh, but there is still a stigma, and many people find that it, it's something they want to try and hide is their roots. And we've heard that that happens also in the education system. So the biggest uh, stigma that we have to deal with is ensuring that travel and people feel that they are part of that community. As I've said already, many of them have set up their own businesses. Many of them have become very successful in shipyards, in car dealerships, in scrap merchants, in caravan supplies, uh, and many, many others. And it, and it was Mr. Welsh himself that said, and I quote, we are just business people. We don't just do tarmac, sell beds and windows. We do big business, but we keep quiet about it. And as I say, there are many uh, who have done that, who have gone out and shown, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that they can be entrepreneurs uh, and widening that. But it's, it's, it's dreadful to think that there still is this uncoyish, 
unconscious bias them towards the traveling community and, and that harbors uh, against them. And I still find it hard to believe that some communities come into conflict with the gypsy travelers uh, and what they're trying to achieve. There can, there can be real opportunities uh, and the opportunities to ensure that there is not a clash of a lifestyle is what we should be looking at. And I have witnessed success of, of purpose-built sites that, for example, in Double Dykes in my own area of Perth and Kinross, that was put there and gave the opportunities, but more sites required to be made, more sites required to be there. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I applaud the Scottish Government for what it's done so far to ensure that gypsy travellers are respected and their opportunities are rightfully deserved. They're entitled to life chances, they're entitled to opportunities, and they're entitled to respect. Thank you. I call full to McGregor to follow by Angus MacDonald. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer, and it gives me great pleasure also to speak in today's debate on improving the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to ensuring equality of opportunity for all of Scotland's gypsy travellers, and this commitment obviously includes the creation of a ministerial working group to develop a programme of work to improve prospects and outcomes for the community. President officer, there is no place in Scotland for the discrimination that our gypsy traveller communities face and other members have already described it today as the last acceptable form of racism. We no longer tolerate other forms of racist abuse and we must all challenge discrimination towards the gypsy traveller community whenever we encounter it in this chamber, in our surgeries and in our local communities. I am sure as elected members we all have examples of doing that. I would like to pay tribute to, to two women, um, Mary Fee, as, as others have mentioned, for her passion on this uh, subject, and also Christina McKelvey, who I know is, is gutted about not being able to make today's debate, um, who has also always raised the issue. Um, as chair of the Racial Equality um, Cross-Party Group myself, we held a session in September last year, President Officer, where Article 12 made a presentation to us, Michael Molden and Lynn Tammy. And we heard how the gypsy traveller community are amongst the most marginalised group in Scotland and that they are frequently unable to enjoy the human rights that others take for granted. Lynn talked to us about the casual discrimination faced by the gypsy traveller community. I know that Annie Wells has already talked about the, uh, the TV programme Big Fat Gypsy Wedding and uh, the, the connotations that, that that brought up and that was something Lynn talked to us about. Michael talked to us about bullying he'd experienced at school and it still goes on. And I think that for anybody else that was there at that particular uh, cross-party group, you would have to have a heart of stone not to be moved by what Michael told us. Diversity and equality training came up in, the, in that particular discussion in schools, and especially if, if, um, if people are seasonally schooled. And uh, there was some discussion on how uh, Amnesty International Scotland's school programme could be used, and also development of school resources uh, in partnership with uh, Show Raises and the Red Card. We had a really good discussion um, at that cross-party group, and the cross-party group, I can confirm, will also follow that up, and I'm going to be a member of Mary Fee's group as well. But also from, from speaking about two, um, two MSPs there who, who have, have fought the case for a long time, uh, to an ex-colleague in, in this chamber, now an MP, Douglas Ross, has already been mentioned by my colleague Ruth Maguire. Um, he was invited to that particular um, cross-party group session uh, following his remarks that were widely circulated in the media. He didn't attend. I would like to put on record Adam Tonkins has just uh, went out of the room, but I would like to put on record that Adam Tonkins did attend and engaged uh, in the discussion and, um, and covered his colleague, if you like, so in the spirit of, of cross-party um, working. Um, I'd like to thank Adam Tompkins for doing that. President officer, as we've all said, there's a lot of diversity uh, amongst the gypsy travel communities in Scotland with different groups speaking a variety of languages and holding to distinct customs and traditions. And the minister is welcome that the ministerial working group is, is taking uh, this on board and, and will help to, to um, help the challenges that members of these communities continue to face. I, I realise I'm running out of time, so I did want to talk about my own area of North Lanarkshire. And I was on the, the North Lanarkshire website today, and I want to read out, President Officer, exactly what it said. Traditionally, in relation to sites for gypsy traveller communities, traditionally there are two kinds of sites provided for the gypsies and travelling community according to the length of stay, transient and long stay. North Lanarkshire Council at one time had three sites, Moss End, Annette Hill and Plains. This gave a combined pitch total of 52. Two sites have since been closed, leaving only one official site at Plains, which had a capacity for 16 pitches. This particular site was a long-term stay site and also had facilities for disabled gypsies and travellers. The site has not been in use for several years, following low demand and major vandalism to the site, which rendered it uninhabitable. A housing needs assessment is currently being undertaken to determine the extent of demand 
or need for further provision. Absolutely shocking, presiding officer. What that basically says is there's no provision. I welcome that they're reviewing it and I'm asking them to make sure that there is provision as soon as possible. And hopefully this working group will help them to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you, President Officer. Last December, this Parliament approved the Race Equality Action Plan, which strikes at the heart of what we try to do every single day in this place, to ensure that Scotland, as a progressive, inclusive nation, treats all of our citizens with equality, no matter their race or background. And as part of that plan, as we've already heard, the Scottish Government set up the Ministerial Working Group to identify the priorities and enact the changes required to improve the lives of our gypsy traveller communities. Improvement, however, must be practical, it must be tangible, and it must be a process which identifies a multifaceted approach to ensure that real equality is delivered. President Officer, it's unfortunately true to say that society has a, a negative attitude towards the gypsy traveller community, the majority of which is based on stereotype, conjecture, misunderstanding, and it has to be said, downright ignorance. And as has been alluded to earlier, what doesn't help is when certain members of our society are quoted eh, as saying gypsies are, in the word of Douglas Ross MP, a blight on our communities that need dealt with, or that if he were to become Prime Minister for the day, his top priority would be, and I quote, tougher enforcement of gypsy travellers, end quote rather than focusing on what can be done to improve equality. Now, thankfully, there's about as much chance of me running the line at the World Cup final as there is of Douglas Ross becoming Prime Minister. However, it remains the fact that that kind of attitude towards gypsy traveller communities creates more barriers than it does help to bring them down. And this is an issue which must be addressed in order for that improvement to be made. So what are we doing and what can be done to make those improvements? Well, if we look at the example of the Public Petitions Committee, in the previous session of Parliament in 2015. Jess Smith from the Travelling Community petitioned the Scottish Parliament regarding the Tinker's Heart, which is the, the title still used for it, a, a pattern of quartz stones laid at a crossroads in the Cairn Dow or Cairn Dew area of Argyll, which is thought to be over 250 years old and has been used by generations of Scottish travellers as a wedding place and for children to be blessed. The monument, which was in danger of being lost due to years of cattle grazing and disregard by the wealthy landowner, was given a lifeline by Historic Scotland due primarily to Jess Smith's petition and the work of the Public Petitions Committee, but also by the intervention of the local MSP, Mike Russell, and subsequently the Culture Secretary, Fiona Hislop. So I'm delighted to say uh, that the Tinker's Heart is now designated a monument of national importance and stands as a reminder of the Gypsy Traveller community's contribution to Scotland's rich cultural heritage. Presiding officer, taking steps to recognise the travelling communities as part of Scotland's cultural heritage and diversity is an important section of the path to equality. It's also important to understand that these people, because they're citizens like the rest of us, have rights and responsibilities too. Access to health and education is priority, and it is also important that people from the gypsy traveller communities are afforded every opportunity to integrate with the communities that they're living in at the time and have the chance to contribute to the already diverse landscape that we have across Scotland. Falkirk Council, for example, have a travelling person site located in my constituency, which I believe the Cabinet Secretary visited recently. Um, I visited the site a few years ago, and uh, this is a, a timely reminder that uh, I'm overdue a, a return visit. Now, CCTV monitors the site, and a travelling persons officer is based there Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, and each of the 15 pitches has access to a chalet and washing and toilet facilities. As part of the process, the progress report and guidance on minimum site standards and site tenants' core rights and responsibilities was published, as we've heard last month, which included a survey undertaken between August 2017 and March 2018. At the time the survey was carried out, Falkirk was one of, the, of only two self-assessments which showed compliance to the standards at the time. However, there are still improvements which can be made, and taking on board the points in the executive summary of the report, more can and should be carried out to ensure the welfare of tenants on these sites are taken into consideration, be it safety or that people are treated, treated fairly and with respect. This is all part of ensuring that improvements are made to the standard that we would all expect as people. Thank you, Mr McDonald. I'm afraid you must conclude. Okay, thank thank you. you. I call Alec Rowley, followed by David Torrance. Mr Rowley, please. Presiding officer, I welcome this debate here in the Parliament today on improving the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers. Positive steps have been taken to recognise the contribution that gypsy travellers make 
and have made to Scotland. But as has been said by many in here today, there is much more that needs to be done at every level of government. I would like to recognise the work of my colleague Mary Fee on this issue, following her members' debate a few weeks ago celebrating Scotland's gypsy traveller community. She has worked to set up a cross-party group on the Scottish gypsy travellers, which will have its first meeting tomorrow, and that's to be welcomed. This will provide a forum to discuss issues faced by the community and hopefully to make recommendations felt necessary for action. It is estimated that there are between 15,000 and 20,000 gypsy travellers in Scotland and the community has made a rich social and cultural contribution to our society. But much more work is needed to improve the lives of gypsy travellers, as has been said today. It is clear from some of the statistics highlighted in Mary Fee's members' debate that inequality has been faced by the community. It is shocking that male life expectancy in the gypsy traveller community is 55 years, 12 years shorter than the average across Scotland. We know that this inequality is rooted in a variety of issues, including the provision of adequate uh, accommodation and access to public health services. Accommodation and health services are human rights and gaining access to them should not be hindered by your background. Clearly work is needed to be done to overcome the barriers facing gypsy travellers and getting the services that they need. Mr Alan Seath, a planning advisor, has highlighted the importance for gypsy travellers to be in control of their land and their homes and emphasises the need to aid the gypsy traveller community with a focus on design, layout and greater site provision instead of enforcement and eviction. He states a more positive outlook in the planning system with robust policies would assist along with well-informed housing needs and demand assessment. We also must recognise the simple fact that gypsy travellers are discriminated against in Scotland and we should not attempt to sweep this issue under the carpet. Everyone will have heard inaccurate stereotypes of gypsy travellers and for some reason this is almost tolerated where other forms of racism are not. But we must recognise this for what it is. It is prejudice, pure and simple. I was shocked to see the survey that Monica Lennon mentioned in terms of social attitudes suggest that 31% of people would be unhappy or very unhappy if a close relative was to marry a gypsy traveller and that 35% said that a gypsy traveller would be unsuitable as a primary school teacher. It is clear more work is needed to change these attitudes. It is encouraging to see the Parliament come together to unite in the view that there is no place for any form of racism in modern and inclusive Scotland. I think the commitment we have heard from the Scottish Government of direct engagement with the gypsy traveller communities is the right step to take and hopefully we can see a more joined up government to address the many issues that we've heard about here today. Thank you very much. And I call David Torrance to be followed by John Mason. Mr Torrance, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the Scottish Government's debate this afternoon for allowing us to discuss the issues being faced by Scotland's gypsy travel community. I also welcome the establishment of a ministerial working group on gypsy travellers as a positive step in creating a more inclusive Scotland. Scotland has one of the best human rights records in the world. Scotland remains the best country in Europe for LGBTI plus equality and human rights. A fair Scotland action plan sets unprecedented measures to tackle child poverty. A really safe strategy begins to devolve deep into the best methods in which to eradicate violence and discrimination against women and girls. The slow transition of some social security powers from reserve to devolved matters has allowed the Scottish Government to finally have a say over this matter. And the Scottish Government has been able to work closely with disabled groups to deliver Scotland's commitment to UN Convention on Rights and of Persons with Disabilities. And this is all relevant. Two weeks ago in the Chamber, I spoke of a small but deeply important part of Scotland's population. I have worked closely with Scotland's gypsy travel community during my time on the Public Petitions Committee in the last parliamentary session, and on the Equalities and Human Rights Committee this session. I am proud of the work the committees have done for the gypsy travel community, particularly for those who gave evidence to protect and preserve the hearts of courts in Argyll and Butte, known locally as the Tinker's Heart. Ancient stones are an integral part of Scotland's history and culture. 
However, this case is just one success in a sea of several challenges. When a caucus committee heard evidence from some members of the Gypsy Travel community in December, we are disappointed to hear that while the Scottish Government and the Scottish Society in general have made some progress in rhetoric, this is not being translated in practice. Reports from previous parliamentary sessions and committees meetings support this trend. In some areas, very little has changed. In other areas, discrimination, marginalisation and hardship has increased. There is to be a fundamental gap in Scotland's human rights and equality's reputation. We currently have enshrined in our law provisions for every member of Scottish society. We have made steps to create a more inclusive Scotland, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation and disability. The Gypsy, gypsy Traveller community, it seems, have not been benefiting from our human rights and equality provisions, despite the fact that we as a society are making progress to tackle hate, crime and discrimination on a wider scale. In this sense, we as a country are failing our Gypsy Traveller communities. The issues faced by the Gypsy Traveller community are well, were accurately and very well high documented. Access to appropriate health care is a major indicator of the depth of discrimination that these communities face. Those who lead a nomadic life are often denied access to health care by GPs, and those who have given up the nom nomadism and have moved into permanent housings continue to face challenges in registering for a GP due to stigma. Mental health services in particular are restricted. Even though suicide rates amongst gypsy traveling men are disproportionately high. This is not helped by restricted access to education, employment and housing. The community also faces prejudice regarding those access suitable sites, including permanent, transit or temporary sites. Institutionalised racism has a real, huge role to play in this regard, coupled with no reference to gypsy traveller communities in the planning process. One young person who gave evidence to a committee referred to an incident in which their camp in Kinloch Rannoch, grounds integral to a gypsy traveller culture, was shut down and is now illegal to camp on. In regards to education, young gypsy travellers are forced to hide their ethnicity for fear of discrimination, leading some to call for a strong affirmative action to challenge institutionalised racism, as well as transitional phases for members of gypsy travel community looking to join mainstream educational facilities. To reiterate my colleague and convener of Equalities and Human Rights Committee, Christina McKelvey, we need to learn from the past to form our actions in the future. I very much hope that the Ministerial Working Group on Gypsy Travellers will begin to address some of the challenges facing the community. Amnesty International's report found that strength in political leadership was required at both national and local level to bridge a gap between local communities, public agencies and local authorities. This is consistent with the committee's evidence heard from members of the Gypsy Traveller community. We need to better appreciate the Gypsy Traveller history and culture as an asset and resource to Scotland's economy and society. And we need to embrace European and international recommendations so that we can create a truly inclusive Scotland for everyone. Thank you. And I call John Mason to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I have to say I'm very pleased to take part in today's debate. Uh, although I'm no longer on the committee that deals with this subject, I previously was on the Equal Opportunities Committee when we produced the report on where gypsy travellers live in 2013. I was just looking back at the summary of that report and it doesn't make any more pleasant reading now than it did then. At that time, we said we were frustrated at the lack of progress in ensuring proper education, health and especially accommodation for the community. And I fear progress has continued to be slow. There were some hard hitting quotes in that report, not least from the committee convener at that time, Mary Fee. I think she spoke for the whole committee when she said we visited sites across Scotland and were appalled at some of the squalid conditions endured by tenants who paid rent and council tax for substandard services. There was also a quote from the Scottish Human Rights Commission describing discrimination against gypsy travellers as the last bastion of respectable racism. And of course it is not respectable or acceptable, but it is seen as acceptable in some circles, including parts of the media. We have a number of minority groups in Scotland who are discriminated against or at least disadvantaged. Some groups are even quite large, but I remain convinced that gypsy travellers are unusual in being such a small and disadvantaged group who are still so openly discriminated against. It is good that since then, the Ministerial Working Group has been set up, as I know it was our feeling then that we needed strong government leadership, and not just to leave it to local government when it came to new site provision and other requirements. As well as Mary Fee, I would commend John Finney and others who have pursued this matter over the years and will not let it go. I think we felt that the pressure on some local councils was such 
that it really needed Scottish Government leadership to support, was the word we used, local authorities and elected representatives. And the wider point, I'm convinced that we all have a responsibility to speak out when we come up against racist remarks. I do accept that terminology can vary and some people use words we would not be comfortable with out of habit rather than evil intent. However, when it comes to traditional stopping places that might be unapproved or unauthorized, it is certainly not helpful to say that they're illegal. The word illegal can be used very loosely at times and it can carry a stigma which, with it, which I think is deliberately damaging. Sometimes we as individuals do need to intervene and say something about words that are being used. Just a few weeks ago, I was sitting in a restaurant table in Edinburgh and heard racist remarks at the next table. That this was not actually about gypsy travelers, but about another racial group. And I just felt that I could not sit there and let it go, but I really had to say something. And in my case, I did not find that particularly easy, and I was not sure what reaction I was going to get from the next table. However, as it turned out, we had a reasonably civilized discussion. So all of us can do our bit in attempting to change attitudes. Just this afternoon, there were young people leading the time for reflection and reminding us not to let prejudice go unchallenged. It is possibly easier here in Parliament, where I think we have broad agreement on this subject. However, it can be difficult in a situation outside if you find yourself in a group of people who are being openly racist. So I commend members who are leading the progress on this. I'm glad that the government is taking it seriously, and you certainly have the support of many of us in the backbenches who are not directly involved ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Stuart Stevenson. Last week in the open debate, then we move obviously to closing speeches. That's a warning to anyone who is not in the chamber who should be paying attention. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. I like uh, Cole Hamilton um, referred to the uh, travellers and gypsy community as being disengaged from the political uh, process. Well, in the 1995 uh, Perth and Kinross by-election, uh, which brought uh, Rosanna Cunningham her parliamentary debut when she won that from the Tories, um, one of the things I was uh, given to do as a campaigner in that by-election was to go and talk to the travellers who were just uh, outside Milnathort. And I found a group of very well-engaged people who had some very focused and relevant questions uh, to ask of the person who'd called the, their door uh, to ask for their vote. We had an animated discussion, followed, I may say, uh, by a very welcome cup of tea and a biscuit. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, that while I did meet a Conservative voter among uh, that group, I use the singular word. Uh, I think the rest of them were quite quick. He will, if permitted. Alec Colham. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. I wasn't trying to suggest that the Gypsy Traveller community are not engaged politically. The inference is among the political classes that they're not engaged politically, so the politicians don't try to reach out to them. Stuart Stevens. I, ho I hope between us we've made the point that at our peril do we neglect uh, the involvement of anyone in our society, uh, including uh, the gypsy and travelling uh, community. Um, now, of course, as my name is Stuart, um, it would be perilous for me to be disconnected because, of course, uh, when my father was a GP and the travellers used to come for the berries and then later in the year for the tatty howkin, uh, there were three names uh, came to the door. Uh, the McPhees, the McAlindans, and of course the Stuarts, who were a well-established Scots uh, travelling family. And I have a queen of people uh, in my family called uh, Stuarts, and I have McPhee. Uh, in my family as well. Uh, I don't know if these were travellers in either case, but I certainly can't uh, disregard the, the possibility. Key thing, of course, is that these people exhibited uh, that we should tack tent of in particular. These people uh, were very self-sufficient. They could teach us a lot about how to make the most of their circumstances and their attributes. The rest of us uh, often lie back um, those who travel and seek work and uh, success where they can find it are actually much stronger people in certain ways uh, than we are. Uh, Kevin Stewart uh, made reference to Jeannie Robertson. Uh, well, I, of course, in turn, will instead make reference to Belle Stewart from Blair Gowrie, who is a very well-known 
uh, Scots uh, folk singer from a traveling family. And just to illustrate how prejudice works in rather curious and irrational ways, uh, she, in the early 1960s, went to the Sidmouth Festival uh, to sing at the invitation of the Sidmouth Festival. And among the people attending there were New Age travelers, not travelers in the traditional sense at all. And they didn't believe that Belle Stewart could possibly be a traveler because she was far too clean. And isn't that another example of the kind of prejudice that was embedded in uh, the, the, the people that she met there? Belle Stewart's biography was written by her daughter and absolutely captures the traveling spirit and the spirit of Belle Stewart. It was called Queen Among the Heather, presiding officer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stevenson. I now call on John Finney to close to the Green Party. Four minutes, Mr. Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and, and I think it's been a very productive debate, and, and lest there be any debate, I absolutely don't doubt the commitment to the ministerial group in relation to this, and I think they are displaying leadership, and that's welcome, as is my colleague Mary Fee with the, the cross-party group, and I, like others, you're going to have a big room tomorrow, uh, <laughs> Mary Fee, because I, I think you're going to have a good attendance. Uh, plenty of talk, insufficient accent, deed not words, radical new approach, radical new approach is what I would like to see. I'm grateful to, to my colleague John Mason for mentioning that traditional stopping off places because um, if we are embracing the issue of the lifestyle and genuinely lending our support to a uh, traveling lifestyle, this will need to be addressed. Now, I've talked many times about uh, what might be seen as the, the, the tension between local and central government, central government not wishing to tread on the toes of the local authorities who have responsibility for planning. Well, can I say that the issue of uh, permitted development doesn't seem to be a, a big issue in agriculture, um, but maybe that says a lot about uh, who's doing the, the uh, uh, who's putting the plans into practice. Um, so I, I think um, you know if we we, we must listen to, to, to voices. And can I say in relation to the women's voices, I'm absolutely delighted to hear that MECOP are getting that money. MECOP do a lot of tremendously good work. There, there were great assistance on a previous occasion when I was on the Equal Opportunities Committee. Um, I know the work they, they do in North Argyll and in, 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 in uh, my constituency. Can I say something perhaps might be seen as strange and indeed controversial? Um, can we involve men, please? Because it's my experience, and it's certainly the experiences of the witnesses we heard from him, and delighted David Donaldson's now involved, that it was, there was no shortage of strong women with very well-informed opinions. Um, and, you know, when I go and visit sites, well, by the very nature, maybe when I go, uh, I don't see many men. So we need to get everyone involved. I think that's important. As regards to the amendments, again, in the short time I have, uh, I think it's entirely reasonable. Um, Annie Wells won about measurable indicators. I, I'm not a great one for statistics. I think we can manipulate statistics to say what we want. What I am interested in is things like quality of life, which isn't so easily measurable. Um, and uh, that will cover things like life expectancy. And of course, life expectancy is something that greatly affects all um, uh, um, impoverished communities. Um, the social attitudes uh, situation uh, is important and it is of course about education. And something I particularly liked hearing was flexible alternative to school-based learning, absolutely. If you're out and about with your family in the countryside um, as travelers, that's a tremendous education for people. And the idea that it's all about academic achievement, I think, is deeply flawed. Uh, Monica Lennon talked about a, a number of groups have touched on MECOP. I also want to mention Article 12 and a lot of very powerful young women in there and Lynn Tammy's work with that. Alex Cole Hamilton used a, 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 a phrase, hostile environment policy. That wasn't specifically, although it was meant to encompass, I'm sure, relating to the gypsy traveller community, but that's entirely what, of course, they have faced all these years. And uh, um, I, I have said once before, I remember meeting a, a senior official once um, about a, a, an issue um, with uh, accommodation, shall we say, um, for uh, the gypsy traveller community. And the business was contracted very officially. And on my departure, he put a sort of paternal hand in my shoulder and whispered in my ear, there's no votes in this for you, John. Well, that's what this shouldn't be about. We should be doing things because they're right, as particularly taken by something that Monica uh, Lehman uh, said in relation to a warden. Things changed when a warden who cared was on the scene. Well, I, I don't doubt anyone in here says uh, the care um, about the Gypsy Traveller community. Of course, how we evidence that care is by our actions. So, 
um, I'm very happy to support amendments from other people and I hope that the very nature of our engagement in this debate and indeed in previous debates will be indicative of how we go ahead and that is together to try and improve things. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Mary Fee to wind up for the Labour Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very grateful to have the opportunity to close this afternoon's debate on behalf of Scottish Labour, celebrating the contribution of Scotland's gypsy traveller community to our nation's shared history. And I too would like to welcome the gypsy travellers to the gallery today and hope that you've not only enjoyed this debate, but that you have taken heart from the commitment that has been demonstrated today by all of us. And we have heard a range of contributions from across the chamber this afternoon. And I'd like to briefly reflect some of these in my closing remarks. And apologies if I miss anyone out. John Finney rightly highlighted the issue of stopping places, an issue that is crucial for gypsy travellers and, and their lifestyles. And I too share John Finney's weariness at lack of progress. David Torrance spoke about the Tinker's Heart, as did Angus MacDonald. David Torrance also spoke of the lack of human rights that the community experiences. Alex Rowley spoke about health inequalities and the lack of access to support and care. And Alex Rowley also spoke of the key importance that planning can play. Alex Cole Hamilton spoke of Seamus McPhee and the work he has done to bring alive gypsy travellers' history through his stories and his art. Gail Ross spoke of the horrific living conditions that gypsy travellers endure and, and I think very few of us fully understand just how horrific those living conditions are unless we have actually seen them. John Mason highlighted some of the findings of the 2013 report when we were both part of the Equalities Committee and I would like to, to, to say to the Chamber that I appreciated all of the work that John Mason did when I was convener of, of that committee John Mason was a powerful advocate on behalf of the gypsy traveller community. And presiding officer, it's right that we recognise and celebrate the rich culture of the gypsy traveller community. In my recent members debate, we heard contributions from across this chamber, celebrating that unique history, the culture and the lifestyle. This parliament came together on that day to support the community and it has done so again today. And it is important that across this parliament, we work constructively with one another to further improve the lived experiences of gypsy travellers across Scotland. And there is so much work to be done. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary is a dedicated and committed advocate for the gypsy traveller community. And I too welcome the establishment of the Scottish Government Ministerial Working Group on Gypsy Travellers. And I welcomed the Cabinet Secretary's opening remarks and her commitment that there will be action, not more warm words. And the establishment of the Gypsy Traveller Women's Voices Project will be a valuable asset, as will the continuing work of Davy Donaldson and the Gypsy Traveller Assembly. And I also welcomed the update from the Cabinet Secretary on the meetings of the Ministerial Working Group. And I look forward to establishing a close working relationship when the cross-party group is formed tomorrow. During the first session of the reconvened Scottish Parliament back in 2001, the Equal Opportunities Committee held an inquiry into gypsy travellers and public sector policies in Scotland. And discussing the 2001 report, young gypsy traveller activist Davy Donaldson stated that over the last 17 years, nothing has changed. We would rightly not accept such a lack of action and lack of progress for any other minority ethnic group in Scotland. And presiding officer, I do accept that some progress has been made. Areas of good practice do exist around inclusion and education for gypsy traveller children, and some progress has been made in health records. However, without building and developing that progress, we risk either standing still or losing momentum. That's what frustrates the community. And presiding officer, that's what frustrates me. In coming to a close, presiding officer, it's right we recognise and celebrate the rich and vibrant contribution of the gypsy traveller community in Scotland. And I'm glad that tomorrow afternoon, I will convene the first meeting of this parliament's cross-party group on gypsy travellers. 
and I'm glad that the Cabinet Secretary has expressed her personal commitment to improving the lives of the gypsy traveller community. But we must not and cannot be complacent. The community don't need rhetoric, they need action. And it is time for the Scottish Government to show real leadership. And it must now take the opportunity to publish its long overdue national strategy for gypsy travellers and begin close engagement with the community, working tangibly to improve the lives of gypsy travellers across Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Jamie Green to close for the Conservative Party. <clears throat> Thank you, presiding Officer. Rhetoric, not action, that's the call from Mary Fee. In what wise words can I add my voice to those? Um, I'd like to commend Mary Fee for uh, establishing the cross-party group. It's very hard work running a cross-party group, uh, uh, trust me, uh, but it's very rewarding as well, uh, especially when you get uh, cross-party consensus. I'd also like to open my comments with some of the words of the Cabinet Secretary when she opened today's debate. She used phrases like, there's been a lot of talk and not a lot of action, and phrases like, it's not good enough. This has to be about deeds, not words. The status quo is not an option. How true, presiding officer, on this subject? There's no denying that there are a pl plethora of issues that have faced the traveller community for a very long time in this country. And it is right that we use our parliamentary time to look at some of these, I think, quite depressing failures. But let us also take this opportunity to celebrate the gypsy traveller community, their history, their culture, their traditions, and their historic place in Scotland. Uh, as Annie Wells and Alex Cole Hamilton said, uh, this is a history that goes back hundreds, uh, if not thousands of years uh, in our lands. Yes, there are issues, and, and I will go into some of them, but let us also emerge from this debate uh, with a positive view of the future for this community. Uh, as Alexander Stewart said in his speech, let us celebrate the great sense of entrepreneurialism and pride in the traditions that exist in this community, a community that is as diverse as any other. And I've said many for, uh, before many times in debates in this chamber, we must take the public with us. Uh, it would be remiss of us to have a debate about gypsy travellers and ignore some of the root causes of so much of the disagreement and apathy. Apathy amongst local councils to deal with the issue of sites. Apathy amongst the settled communities with often misinformed views born out of prejudice or bad experiences or poor community relations or inherent prejudice uh, and on occasion perhaps born out of a mutually negative lack of understanding between the needs and the views of both sides of many of these difficult arguments. Today's debate has thrown light on a number of the day-to-day -day issues that affects gypsy travellers. I'd like to touch on some of them specifically. On health, figures reveal that 38% uh, of gypsy travellers had long-term illnesses compared to just 26% of the rest of the population. It is frequently reported that gypsy traveller men and women live 10 and 12 years less, respectively, than the general population. That is a disgrace. Uh, I, can I point to the great work of Pavi Point, which is an Irish NGO, uh, that also did some studies uh, into that community and found that 11% of traveller deaths in Ireland were uh, attributed to suicide. Uh, the suicide rate for travellers in Ireland is six or seven times higher than that in the settled community. I don't know the figure in Scotland, but I suspect it's not great either. The question is, why is this the case? And what are we going to do to address this? On education, there's been a lot of discussion around that. We know that uh, gypsy traveller children achieve lower educational attainment compared to the national trend. It is, uh, as some estimates put it, around 20% of gy gypsy traveller children of secondary school age attend school regularly and it is perhaps likely they suffer the lowest atten attainment of any uh, minority community in Scotland. But there are themes uh, connecting the barriers to education uh, to their results and they include a number of issues which, that we should discuss, perhaps even controversially, around enforced mobility and interrupted learning. Interrupted learning is an issue that has to be addressed. Anyone that was brought up in a military home will know how interruption and continuous movement from one place to another, uh, the effect that this has on learning. But what are we doing to fix this? What flexibility is in the education system to cater for that lifestyle? And we don't talk enough about excessive exclusions from school, or we don't talk enough about inadequate school responses to bullying by students 
by their parents and perhaps even on occasion teachers simply turning a blind eye to harassment. The list goes on. The lack of validation of gypsy culture in our schools, the limited relevance of the curriculum to many of them, and even teachers' low expectations. How sad is that? Let me also talk about justice. There are disproportionate levels of antisocial behavior orders against gypsies and travelers. There are high uses of remand and custody, and there is real cultural dislocation within the prison service. What are we doing to address those issues? And, presiding officer, perhaps we should talk about the elephant in the room. Research by Amnesty International found that the gypsy traveler community received disproportionate levels of media coverage, of which uh, more than half was entirely negative. Now, much of that discussion is around the issue of sites, and we have debated that. I do welcome the commitment from the government to address issues around guidance and standards. But uh, if I could point uh, towards uh, that specific subject and the Green Amendment today, um, reading uh, the amendment, uh, which I, I, I have absolute sympathy with its positive intentions, uh, in our view, it does actually lack some clarity. It, it references the mapping of all stopping places and making these available. My, my problem with that is it doesn't sound like a coordinated strategy for providing suitable and adequate sites, suitable and adequate sites. And for that reason, we are uh, perhaps unable to support that amendment, but I'd be happy to give way to Mr. Finney. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the member giving way, particularly given his concluding comment there. It's purposely meant to be a direction of travel rather than prescriptive. This isn't legislation we're talking about. It's a suggestion to government to move forward in this consensual way. So that's the basis of the amendment. Jamie Green. No, I appreciate that further clarification. I, I think perhaps if the wording was uh, geared to uh, provide a uh, coordinated approach to providing adequate and suitable sites rather than just that all stopping places must be made available. There are many stopping sites which are simply inadequate in our view. Uh, and for that reason, uh, that's why I, I bring it up. But perhaps I could uh, close with um, uh, some other commentary around this. The debate's been peppered with phrases around race and ethnicity, not lifestyle choices, and I'm pleased by that. And that is the key. We are discussing one of Scotland's ethnic communities. The, uh, the debate should reflect that. They have not only been treated unfairly in the past, but in many respects are still being treated unfairly. Uh, I've said before that prejudice is born out of fear, but fear can only be overcome by understanding and mutual respect. But understanding comes through education and by leadership and, presiding officer, through action not just warm words or sympathetic debates, but top-down government policy, which filters its way through government directorates, through policing, through the NHS, through social services, our education system, and even down to local authorities. It is time to have a frank, sensible, and realistic debate about some of these issues. History has repeated itself far too often for far too long when it comes to the gypsy traveler community. So I say less words, more action, please. Thank you. And I call on Angela Constance, the Cabinet Secretary, to wind up and take us up to uh, the top of the hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Officer. I want to thank all members for their thoughtful and insightful uh, contributions to this afternoon's debate. And I am very glad that it has been uh, consensual uh, and uh, very positive too, because that demonstrates that as a parliament uh, and indeed as a country, I hope that we are committed uh, to working together to improve the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers. I want to put on record, President Officer, that I'll be supporting all amendments that are tabled by the Labour Party, the Conservatives uh, and indeed uh, Mr Finney today. Uh, and actually I have uh, already answered in previous uh, parliamentary questions how we would take forward uh, the detail of these uh, suggestions. Many members have spoken passionately uh, about gypsy travellers they have met or worked with uh, either in their constituencies uh, or as members of committees. And many members have spoken passionately about the personal impact it's had upon them when they've had the opportunity to listen to the personal testimonies of people directly uh, from the community. And speaking for myself, uh, when I've listened uh, to these experiences and testimonies, they have been both jaw-dropping and eye-opening in terms of the day-to-day -day challenges faced by individuals and this community collectively. Members uh, such as Annie Wells, Alex Cole-Hamilton uh, and many other members have 
uh, spoken very powerfully about the need to celebrate uh, gypsy traveller heritage and culture. Indeed, it was John Finney who said that the gypsy traveller heritage is part of our country and part of Europe, both root and branch. And Angus uh, MacDonald uh, rightly paid tribute to the work uh, to recognise the Tinker's Heart uh, as a national uh, monument of national importance. And we heard from Stuart Stevenson, uh, his love of the folk singer, uh, Belle Stewart. I've been uh, particularly struck by the work of Damien Labasse, uh, who's been writing about his journey to reconnect uh, with his own uh, traveller roots. And he uh, is on record as saying that from the highlands to the border, Scotland has a gypsy history that has yet to be recognised. And that's something that we will work very hard to, to change. He also uh, explores that perhaps his own journey uh, will solve the bizarre contradiction of Britain's uh, love affair with caravanning, camping and glamping, and yet it has a hatred of those who were born to this life and who largely inspired its adoption uh, as a non-Gypsy pastime. And as one, gypsy, one Scottish Gypsy traveller put it, there are 80,000 members of the caravan club, uh, but I uh, am not uh, allowed to travel. Picking up on the contributions from members uh, this afternoon, uh, Monica Lennon uh, and others spoke about the need to improve both the quality uh, and uh, quantity uh, of sites and Fulton McGregor uh, and Alexander Stewart spoke very powerfully about the need uh, to establish uh, more sites also. And while decisions about the provision of gypsy traveller sites uh, are indeed uh, made at a local level, these decisions should be based on, yes, those with local knowledge, yes, those with local accountability, but they also need to be based uh, on local need. So the issues that Alec Rowley touched upon around um, local housing strategies and housing demand needs assessments uh, do need to be addressed, and we very much look forward to taking forward that uh, in our joint work and our partnership uh, with COSLA as well. Now, I very much uh, take on board what uh, John Finney was saying in terms of language and also uh, in the need to uh, be reaching out into the men within the community. Um, his uh, personal reflections uh, are indeed something that I've reflected upon in terms of my own engagement uh, with the community, that I have indeed had more engagement uh, with women uh, as opposed to uh, the men in the community. But there is uh, some work that's imminent, particularly around uh, some of the issues around planning, um, where um, uh, some of the men in the community are very keen to work uh, with the, the Scottish Government. I also uh, take on board John Finney's point uh, about language and that perhaps there's a need to be talking more about accommodation um, and not uh, housing. And of course, in terms of these issues, we will work hand in glove um, with the community. But can I suggest that in our work and striving for practical solutions and practical actions, it is important that we do look at specific suggestions, whether that's around uh, informal halting stops uh, or indeed uh, the uh, negotiated uh, stops, which is some very um, interesting work uh, that's going on south of the border um, in Leeds. And by negotiating stopping, um, this describes uh, an agreement reached between a local authority and members of the Gypsy Traveller community. Uh, and my officials, uh, along with members of the community, uh, are going to investigate uh, this very uh, practical solution uh, in Leeds uh, this week. Other members have me mentioned the issue about site standards. As a government, we have made our position crystal clear. Uh, site standards are not consistently good enough. We were very proactive in making our views known. Uh, the Minister for Housing has indeed written uh, to local authorities and registered social landlords. And we have made clear that standards are indeed a minimum and that everyone in Scotland uh, has the right to expect accommodation that is of a good standard. And that includes our gypsy traveller community. No, no thanks just now. Um, and we, of course, published a report, um, and this is now a matter uh, for the Scottish uh, Housing Regular. In the time that I've got left, I want to touch uh, briefly on uh, education. Uh, I have seen some excellent examples of flexible learning opportunities. Uh, for example, the Gypsy Traveller Education Group in Lark Hall, uh, which enables young Gypsy travellers uh, to get the support uh, they need to reach their full potential. 
And if I can just um, mention, because I am a strong advocate for developing Scotland's young workforce, because therein lies uh, the route to flexible learning opportunities that can take young people into an apprenticeship, into further or higher education, or indeed into the world of work, or indeed into the world uh, of self-employment. So that flexibility, that ability to have uh, non-school-based uh, education opportunities already exists in our education system. We just have to find uh, better ways uh, to make it happen more consistently uh, across the country. And I'm also conscious that many uh, members have spoken very powerfully uh, about health inequalities uh, that exist uh, within the community as well. And there has been some progress uh, since uh, 2012. Uh, we've seen the, the publication of leaflets to inform the community of their rights to register with the GP. And I know that NHS 24 uh, have done a lot of work uh, in terms of awareness raising, uh, in terms of those uh, who will be trying to work with the community in and out of hours based but there is absolutely no doubt about it and let me be crystal clear that we need to do much much more to address the very stark uh, health inequalities uh, and the differences uh, in life expectancy amongst other because presiding officer it is that fear of discrimination and actual discrimination that prevents the gypsy traveller community from accessing um, essential public services that have contributed uh, to poor um, outcomes Presiding officer, in the, the few seconds that I have left, I do want to take the opportunity uh, to take full advantage of this debate being on government time, which means that as we uh, approach decision time, that this chamber is full and everybody is here and in their seats. So what I very uh, deliberately want to do to end this debate is to end this debate where we all started. And that is by saying, on behalf, I hope, of this entire chamber, to the members of the Gypsy Traveller community that are here with us today, but also those members uh, who live the length and breadth of Scotland, that this indeed is your parliament. You have every right to be here. And like all citizens of Scotland, you have every right to expect the very highest standards of representation. And you have every right to expect every parliamentarian here today and every councillor to work together. And most of all, you have every right to expect that those of us who occupy public office and public service to work with you, to work with you to ensure that we end the discrimination and disadvantage, to ensure that your children have every chance and to ensure that your elders are cared for and to ensure that your voices are heard. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on improving the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers. We turn now to decision time. There are four questions. The first question is that Amendment 12690.1 in the name of Annie Wells, which seeks to amend Motion 12690 in the name of Angela Constance on improving the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 12690.3 in the name of Monica Lennon, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 12690.2 in the name of John Finney, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to our division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12690.2 in the name of John Finney is yes, 76, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 12690 in the name of Angela Constance as amended on improving the lives of Scotland's gypsy travellers be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. That concludes decision time.
We will now move on to members' business in the name of Maurice Connery on Orkambi. But we'll just take a few moments for uh, the members and for the minister to change seats.